Today, there are over 50 countries around the world which continue to use the death penalty. Individuals who break the law can face a firing squad in China, lethal injection in the USA, and the hangman's noose in Singapore. It is only a decade since capital punishment was finally removed from British law. For centuries, Britain carried out state executions, and capital punishment was defended as a deterrent against crime, retribution against those who broke society's rules. The noose would be put over their neck, a hood put over their head, and the cart would drive away, leaving them to dangle and to gradually, slowly, up to 30 minutes, to strangle to death. For over 200 years, a moral battle raged about whether the state has the right to execute. A powerful liberal elite emerged, determined to abolish the death penalty. The death penalty is inhuman and degrading when you see how it is carried out and the procedures that are necessary. But the vast majority of public opinion has continued to demand the ultimate punishment. There are certain sorts of murder that are so premeditated, so violent, and so shocking that in the interest of maintaining confidence in the rule of law, the only appropriate punishment is the death penalty. This debate has shaped our ideas about how a civilized society should punish its citizens in the 21st century. The word punishment comes from the same root as pain. It is in its essential conception painful. If it is not painful, it is not punishment. The history of capital punishment in Britain is a long and bloody one. Since the Middle Ages, those condemned to death have variously faced being boiled alive, burnt at the stake, or hung, drawn and quartered. But it was in the late 18th century that the death penalty was applied most widely. London, 1783. Thousands crammed the streets of the capital to watch a public execution carried out in the king's name. This is the height of the bloody code. A system of justice and punishment that listed over 200 offenses for which a man or woman could be sent to the gallows. In a society in which, as they would have expressed it in those days, they were lovers of liberty and very keen on property, uh, they had to have a means of protecting both their liberty and the property. So you don't want a standing police force and you don't want a standing army. And therefore, there was the very successful argument in Parliament that you had capital punishment for just about everything. Under the bloody code, even petty theft, like pickpocketing or stealing a sheep, could result in the death penalty and it also threatened to execute anyone who kept the company of gypsies for more than a month, or who blackened their face with the intention of stealing. Because we've lost sight of its meaning to contemporaries, and we can reach only for one explanation, that those people two, three hundred years ago were barbarians compared to us. But go back to the 18th century, and you have very few prisons, very inefficient policing, but you do have the noose, and the noose is understood not as a cruel device, uh, but as a way of testifying to the anger of the king. The execution day started at Newgate Prison, just to the um, west of St. Paul's in the center of, of town, and the procession went from the gates of Newgate through High Holborn, what is now modern um, Oxford Street, on to the site of um, Tyburn. 
From the Middle Ages, Tyburn had been the traditional site of the majority of public executions in Britain. The condemned would probably try and wear their best clothes. Some would put up a big, brave show, and they would be taken along this route where people would um, either stand on the street or the better off would actually hire out rooms on either side of the streets. With no police force or prison system, capital punishment served as a deterrent against crime. It was therefore important that everyone in society should attend to witness justice being carried out. And there was one occasion where a school teacher was reprimanded by the moral authorities, probably by the local newspapers, because he decided to take his children on a picnic so they wouldn't see the execution. This was considered a very bad thing to do. The trouble was learning a moral lesson from the death of somebody else um, was what the moralists wanted. It wasn't often what they got because people would frequently go along there in more of a party atmosphere. The execution day had its own ritual involving the participation of the crowd itself, which appeared to revel in a macabre party atmosphere. But some historians have interpreted this scene very differently. It misses the silence that descends when the executioner comes onto the platform. When top hats came into fashion, it misses the point of the big cry, hats off. It misses the kinds of communication that were possible between members of the crowd and the felons about to, be di about to die. The jokes, the teasings, the cries from the crowd, hello, Curly, keep up your spirits. Of course, a poor sod was actually shitting and pissing himself in sheer bloody terror. Capital punishment as a deterrent was believed to work due to the painful nature of the executions. Hangings often ended in a slow strangulation. If they were lucky, their friends would pull on their legs to help end their misery. This is the origin of the phrase, pulling your leg. The watching crowd knew that a person's social class would have determined whether they were executed. One of the great defenses of the death penalty was the idea that somehow every aristocrat and every member of the gentry was subject to the same laws. In fact, it's not true. It's self-evidently not true. 99.9% .9 of everybody who was executed by the state were, was dirt poor and from the lowest class of, um, of Britain. The vanishingly small number of aristocrats and members of the gentry who ended their lives in execution did so by dint of being psychopaths and lunatics. The accused faced trial by a jury drawn from the local community many of whom were sympathetic to the defendant's case. Frequently, these juries sought to commute the punishment to avoid the death penalty. Many juries, for example, refused to value property at their full value, precisely in order to prevent a capital charge being applied in that particular case. Juries also regularly, um, regularly pleaded for mercy, even after they'd found somebody guilty and seen them um, sentenced to, to be hanged. Between 1770 and 1830, over 35,000 people were sentenced to death. But only one in 10 were actually executed. But the elite in society were indifferent to any notions of unequal justice. They believed capital punishment worked as a deterrent. And even enlightened thinkers of the time, such as the churchman and philosopher William Paley, were able to justify this even if innocent people were executed. 
And when he was told that many people were hanged who didn't deserve it or who might even be innocent, oh, he said, in a very fine language, of course, uh, so what? These people may be deemed to have hanged for England. In other words, their deaths were part of the price we had to pay for social order and deference to the established hierarchy. This view was supported by the work of German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who argued that even in a civilized society, the state had the right to punish the individual. For Kant, the only purely evil thing is an evil will. So you measure the seriousness of the crime by the attitude of the criminal. For Kant, the death penalty was a moral imperative. It was a duty, but it was to be done without any emotion. We did it as a matter of duty. And in fact, we celebrate human dignity by executing them, by saying, you are a responsible agent. You chose to do what you do, what you did, and you deserve to die for it. We will not look at you as a means to deter others from committing crimes. He firmly believed that you never use a person as a means to your ends. Human beings are ends in themselves. Kant's ideas continued to influence the debate about punishment into the 19th century and a new Victorian era. But by the 1830s, the election of the Whigs into government brought a new reforming agenda. The Reform Act famously gives the vote to the middle classes, but also a lot of the statutes on the bloody code are repealed. So that by the end of the 1830s, uh, you can hang really only for murder. Despite this new age of reform, the Victorians were still committed to retaining the death penalty for those convicted of murder. But for other lesser crimes, they wanted a more proportional punishment that fitted the crime. So a sheep stealer would no longer be treated the same as a murderer. Punishment ought to be not only proportional, but by being proportional to the offense, rational. Measurement proportionality is one big idea that begins to unseat the old system uh, that had, of course, gone back for centuries. Dismantling the bloody code had an immediate effect on the Victorian justice system. Now juries were more likely to convict in the knowledge that the death penalty no longer applied. They eliminated capital punishment from rape in 1842. And what happened afterwards is that the conviction rate went straight through the roof. It went from a modern um, equivalent of about 5% convictions to between 13 and 18% conviction rates, simply because they changed the nature of the punishment associated with that particular crime. But as conviction rates soared, so too did the Victorians fear of crime. This fear came from the presence of a new mass urban population, which during the Industrial Revolution had migrated to Britain's cities in their thousands. As you start to have very large numbers of fairly poor people crowded into districts together, society is becoming much more concerned about criminality, about the possibility of a criminal underclass, about the, the consequences of having so many poor people congregated in very small areas. One of the other things that's happening in the early 19th century is for the first time the government is starting to collect figures as to how many people are brought before the courts. And again, the figures always seem to be going up. Of course, we know now that the population is rising anyway. The figures seem to be going up, so of course that helps to kind of contribute to this fear of crime, which is really starting to emerge in the early 19th century. In 1862, there is a moral panic about mugging that is precipitated in the newspapers by one solitary event when an MP called Pilkington was mugged by a garotta. With conviction rates rising, but fewer crimes subject to the death penalty, 
the Victorians searched for new ideas about punishment. Up until now, local jails had just held prisoners before they were punished. But into the 1840s, as part of a wider expansion of the state and the ending of transportation as a sentencing option, the Victorians began to build large prisons across Britain as places of both punishment and reform. A new idea of prison where you have the ordered prisons with the sexes separated, different kinds of criminals are classified, being made to perform useful work as part of their punishment, all in a specially designed building separate, set apart from the rest of the community. But those convicted of murder still faced a public execution, which by the mid-Victorian era was coming under attack from an educated elite. You got prominent publicists as well, so Dickens and Thackeray being probably the most prominent, who both attended public executions and both wrote about them. Both of them were appalled by the behavior of the people. It was so loathsome, pitiful, and vile a sight. I did not see one token in all the immense crowd, at the windows, in the streets, on the housetops, anywhere of any one emotion suitable to the occasion. No sorrow, no terror, no abhorrence, no seriousness, nothing but ribaldry, debauchery, levity, drunkenness, and flaunting vice. The public execution is almost a way of saying that aggression and violence is acceptable and tolerable and it's kind of promoted by the state. And this is the very last thing that the Victorians want. They've got a kind of a civilizing idea. It was this disgust at the scene of a public execution that led to the first real movement to abolish the death penalty. By the 1840s, there's a really very serious uh, movement for total abolition of capital punishment in England that pulls in people like Thackeray. The argument being that we have other ways of controlling order so that we do not need to resort to the sledgehammer uh, control delivered by the noose. But the vast majority of the population were convinced that the death penalty should be retained. And this view was openly supported by the Church of England. Now, capital punishment is a peculiar punishment because it was justified specifically on biblical terms. All the arguments were to do with the Bible. Um, after all, fines or community service, or even being put in the stocks, don't actually appear in the Bible. You know, they have killed the image of God, another human being, and so they will be killed themselves. And that was accepted by practically everyone. Convinced that the death penalty was sanctioned by God, the Victorians turned to their newly built prisons to solve the debate over public executions. It was one of the suggestions of Bishop Wilberforce that we've got these wonderful prisons. Why don't we put capital punishment into a prison? In 1868, the last public execution was carried out on British soil. Michael Barrett, an Irish Republican, was hanged outside Newgate Prison while the crowd sang a popular music hall tune, Champagne Charlie. By moving the gallows into the prison, the authorities also wanted to introduce a more official and systematic way of killing, which would be carried out by professional hangmen. But you had the rise of regular hangmen one of the things they could do, and this was developed in a very systematic way, was they could take the weights and measurements of the person they were going to kill. They would view them in a prison cell through a loophole so they could gauge this person's stocky, this person's thin, this person's five foot three or whatever. And then when there was scales and measurements by which you could then judge how much rope you would use and the quality of the rope. That would ensure that you neither made it too long, in which case you might decapitate the person, 
or too short, in which case you might strangle the person, just the right length, which should lead to instantaneous death. Hangmen were now expected to carry out their duties in an orderly and responsible fashion. One of the concerns that the Home Office had was the um, amount of drinking um, that the executioners used to engage in. And so that was restricted. From then on, they had to spend the night in the prison before the hanging, and they were only allowed a quarter pint of spirits and uh, a couple of pints of ale the night before. So it was all much more dignified. This move towards a dignified system of capital punishment silenced those voices who had called for the abolition of the public execution. And once it's proposed to hide the executions in the prison, the argument is, is one for sustaining capital punishment all the way through to the 60s. So it's a key moment. Had there not been a solution to the problem of the crowd found in the hiding of executions, uh, the whole thing might have collapsed much earlier than it did. The Victorian era saw a major shift in how a modern, civilised society maintains order and administers punishment. The great transformation of punishment in the modern era moved its locus from the body to the personality. That is, originally punishment was the infliction of pain and suffering on the body. And then the Enlightenment came along. And the Enlightenment embraced the idea of, of human beings as rational. And instead of inflicting pain and suffering on the body, we took the great good not to be so much life as liberty. So that we now correlate the heinousness of the crime with a degree of loss of liberty. And instead of inflicting pain and suffering directly on the body, what we do is we deprive people of rights. For the next 60 years, it appeared that those who supported capital punishment had won the debate. Into the first half of the 20th century, executions continued inside the walls of Britain's prisons without any significant opposition. While public opinion remained solidly in favour, only a handful of eccentrics, like the heiress Violet van der Elst, campaigned against the death penalty. Mrs van der Elst was one of those curious figures in, in capital punishment because she was a classic, eccentric Englishwoman. She inherited a lot of money and she decided not to take up the cause of cats and dogs, but to take up the cause of capital punishment. And because of her money and her sense of stage management, she could ensure big displays wherever she went. So, for instance, when executions were taking place in prison, she would drive up to the prison in a Rolls Royce. So she was much more difficult for the authorities to handle because you couldn't just sort of knock her out the way. A, she's a woman. B, she's rich. C, she's sort of rich and well-connected. And she's in a Rolls Royce. In some ways, of course, she was a person that proponents of capital punishment could point to and say, well, it's, it's lunatics who are really concerned about this sort of thing. Kept from view by the authorities, capital punishment was now largely beneath the public's radar. But this would change in the aftermath of the Second World War. By executing Nazi war criminals, Britain and its wartime allies were exacting a visual show of justice. 
and over 200 of these executions were carried out by British hangman, Albert Pierpoint, whose deployment to Germany propelled him into the spotlight. Of course, in the early part of the 20th century, the, the hangman, the executioner, had been an obscure figure. He was an agent of the state. His identity was covered up. What made Albert Pierpoint a celebrity was not executing people in the 1930s, but it was when he goes off to Nuremberg at the end of the Second World War and he executes all these Nazi war criminals. And the press sort of dig and find out his identity, and he becomes a celebrity because he's oddly a kind of patriotic icon. You know, it's one of our boys who has had the last word in the war by stringing up all these awful Nazis. I mean, that's the sort of way it's presented. And Pierpoint then becomes the first and only modern executioner celebrity. Pierpoint became a familiar face to British audiences through numerous television interviews. You always get in, you get a new rope and an old rope. Well, we always choose the old rope if we can. Because a new rope, it seemed to lash back. See what I mean? Mm. Springing on it, you see. And if you get an old one that had been used before, you've got to examine it well before you use it. Yeah. And you see, you leave a sandbag on that, same weight, hanging overnight. You see? And it's all prepared for the morning then. There's a kind of macabre fascination to him, I think. And the reason that you have that is, I think, because the concept of executing people has become so detached from people's ordinary lives. In a very ordered, settled, consensual society, to be the person who actually carries out the sentence has this kind of weird exoticism to it, and I think that's why he became such a public name. Did it matter how you've attached the rope? Oh, yes, there's a certain way in doing it. To be instantaneous, yes, definitely. It, 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 it has on the rope, at the end of the rope, a, a brass brass ring like, and the rope goes through that, you see, and you put that under the left jaw, you see, and when he falls and stops dead, it finishes under the chin, should finish under the chin, he th throws his head back and breaks the final cord. The British public may have supported the Nuremberg executions, but by the 1950s, there was increasing disquiet at the continued use of the death penalty. In 1953, this unease was evident in the case of Derek Bentley. Bentley, along with his accomplice, Christopher Craig, were stealing from a warehouse when they were confronted by the police. Craig fled, but Bentley was arrested and was alleged to have shouted, let him have it, moments before Craig shot dead PC Sydney Miles. As Craig was only 16, Bentley would hang for the murder. It also transpired that uh, Derek Bentley had a, a mental age of something like 11, that he came from a rather disturbed background. These facts were withheld from the jury at the trial. He had certainly not been the leader in this enterprise of, um, of uh, breaking into this uh, warehouse. Uh, he'd been easily captured by the police, and the police simply said that he had shouted out to Craig as he came up onto the roof, let him have it. Um, that was much disputed. The case rested on the prosecution's assumption that let him have it was an encouragement to shoot the policeman, not to hand the gun over. But many of the public disagreed with this interpretation. And there was even doubt that he had said this at all. I think everybody thought that he would uh, be reprieved. And when he wasn't reprieved, there was a great deal of public concern, both in the press, but also by people going along to the prison in the morning and creating a large demonstration. The apparent injustice led to some public sympathy for Bentley and to a questioning of the state's right to execute a mandatory death sentence on a vulnerable individual. I think what that demonstrated was that to have a system 
which, in which the death penalty was mandatory for murder, and in which everything, uh, every way of trying to classify murders as those that were death worthy and not death worthy, came down to a political decision of a Secretary of State. That particular Secretary of State decided that he would not act in the favor of Derek Bentley. So there seemed to be a gross unfairness in the case. Bentley's case caught the public's attention through its coverage in the press. Through the 1950s, capital punishment began to be openly debated on the pages of the nation's newspapers. Britain had one of the highest rates of newspaper readership in the entire world. And there's enormous competition between, you know, the sort of the people, the news of the world, the mirror, the mail, the express and so on. And they use kind of those classic kind of Victorian staples of sex and sensation and murder and whatnot to sell copies. In 1955, the press seized on the story of Ruth Ellis, a young woman sentenced to hang for the murder of her lover. We have to say that there's an element of interest in the fact that it was an attractive woman, that it was a crime of passion, so-called. She wasn't necessarily a sympathetic person. She, in, in those times when uh, promiscuity was uh, decried even more than today, she'd had a couple of lovers, she had two children. There were quite a bit of concern that she didn't just shoot him once, but several times. But there was a degree of public empathy for Ruth Ellis. Like the Bentley case two years earlier, people questioned whether this crime of passion should carry a mandatory death sentence. The idea that a distraught woman acting in a passionate moment uh, would go to the gallows, I think caught the public imagination and made people question uh, whether that was the right thing uh, to be doing to a young woman. And that raised the further question then, if it was not right to do it for young women, was it right to do it to young men? Um, and so I think the debate, if you look uh, at the papers, I think she is the, and the way her case was treated, uh, was the catalyst for what would later become a campaign. Both Bentley and Ellis were hanged by Britain's chief executioner, Albert Pierpoint. Such was the controversial nature of the Ellis and Bentley cases that in 1957, the Conservative government passed the Homicide Act, which introduced the new defences of provocation and diminished responsibility for murder. So they brought in that some murders would be capital murders, what the Americans call first degree murders, capital murders, and other murders, the pub fight, the domestic dispute, the, or whatever, would not be. This law resulted in fewer executions, with only five or six people a year being sent to the gallows. But the Homicide Act caused confusion. We don't know why some are hanged and some are reprieved. One Sunday newspaper posed this question and gave these examples. Francis Forsyth, 18, murdered Alan G as he was walking home. He robbed him and kicked him unconscious with his pointed shoes. Forsyth was executed. But David de Duca, 21, did much the same thing. He battered an old man to death and stole his wallet. De Duca was reprieved. Those sort of anomalies convinced quite a lot of people, including members of the judiciary, which was the other, the other change really took place in the, in, the, in the 50s and early 60s. You actually got members of the judiciary thinking that this just wasn't going to work anymore. The debate over capital punishment peaked in December 1964, when a Labour MP, Sidney Silverman, submitted a private member's bill to Parliament. Silverman's bill proposed an experiment, the suspension of all executions for five years. <laughs> 
on the 21st of December 1964. As Parliament debated this bill, the BBC screened a live debate between proponents of capital punishment and abolitionists. In two and a half hours from now, we shall know whether or not hanging for murder is likely to be abolished in Great Britain. At this moment, the House of Commons is locked in debate on capital punishment. There'll be a free vote at 11 o'clock. But I believe that this particular penalty for particular people, namely professional criminal, criminals, is the one real deterrent. And this argument about deterrence, of course, is the standard argument that's been put for 150 years in respect of every form of capital punishment and has always been proved wrong. Astonishing that Henry Brooke should bring testimony today to say that he's now convinced that that particular argument cannot, um, uh, cannot be borne out. I, I Later that evening, Sidney Silverman's bill was passed by 200 votes to 98. But it didn't reflect public opinion on the issue. Despite much sympathy for cases like Bentley and Ellis, there was still widespread support for capital punishment. In polls in the 1960s, people said the one thing about the whole of the 1960s that they disliked most was the abolition of the death penalty. So what you have, effectively, is um, an elite-driven, kind of liberal establishment um, project to reform the death penalty. Now that comes from, I guess, education and from a different moral outlook and whatnot, but it also rests on something that we just simply don't have today, which is a sense that the people in Parliament know better. They know best. And they are not dependent on the kind of popular will, if you like, on popular opinion for their mandate. So, in a funny way, the abolition of the death penalty would be impossible in today's parliament. It's something that was only possible in the 50s and 60s because we, they didn't have that kind of populist political culture that we have today. Despite parliament's ruling, the debate over capital punishment continued to rage throughout the 1960s. And they were expecting that if you could abolish it with uh, a parliament, that you could also bring it back through parliament. So naturally enough, any high-profile case, um, especially one which might, as it were, lead to at least bringing it back partially, say for the murder of policemen, um, or for a particularly violent set of murders, um, these were leapt on by newspapers in order to try and reverse the decision. In October 1965, less than a year after abolition, the resolve of Parliament would be tested by one of the most notorious murder cases of the 20th century. We think of the mid-60s as this great utopian, happy-go-lucky, um, kind of orgiastic age where everyone's having a great time. In fact, the mid-60s was a much more anxious, darker time than we remember. In what would become known as the Moore's murders, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley kidnapped tortured and killed five children, burying them in shallow graves on Saddleworth Moor. On these bleak and desolate moorlands, 1,600 feet up in the Pennines, senior police officers believe they'll find two more bodies, possibly a third. It's impossible to overstate how shocking those crimes were, particularly when the tapes were played in court and then reported in the newspapers. At their trial, there was public outrage when a tape recording was played to the court of Brady and Hindley torturing 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey. And that means that within a year of the suspension of the death penalty, you have newspaper columnists and particularly kind of, you know, people in the pub, people on street corners and whatnot, calling for the death penalty to be brought back because there are, there are kind of two people who to people in the 1960s seem ideal candidates for the hangman's noose. It's Brady and Endley. The overwhelming majority wanted to see Brady and Hindley hang for their crimes. But public pressure could not convince the government. Brady and Hindley were both sentenced to life imprisonment. A life sentence for murder was now mandatory following the suspension of the death penalty in 1965. 
the mandatory life sentence was brought in as a condition of abolishing the death penalty. Those who opposed abolition were told by those who advocated it and who in the end prevailed that they would always be safeguarded because there would be this mandatory life sentence. The mandatory life sentence was aimed at extending the amount of time a convicted murderer could be imprisoned for. In the days of capital punishment, those reprieved, and that was the majority of murderers who were reprieved, served sentences considerably lower um, than they would serve today, despite the media thinking we are soft on crime. Craig, who couldn't be sentenced to the hangman because of his age when Bentley was executed, served 11 or 12 years for the shooting of a police officer. Now, even as a 16-year-old, he would s probably serve a minimum of 25, so sentence doubled. In fact, under today's tariff system, some prisoners serving life sentences are eligible for early parole. But this raises its own moral questions about how the state punishes individuals, like Harry Roberts, who's been locked up for 44 years, convicted after the murder of three policemen in 1966. I think it's extremely cruel to lock someone up forever, but in a slightly different way from executing them, because it's the, it's the gift that keeps on giving. If you see what I mean, you're, you know, you're in prison maybe for 40 or 50 years. I mean, Harry Roberts, who was the man who murdered the three policemen in Shepherd's Bush, is still in jail after 44 years. I happen to believe he should still be there because he committed three very, very nasty, gratuitous murders. And if you let someone like Harry Roberts out, and there has been talk about that doing so, you're effectively saying to other people who might want to kill the police, oh yes, he was away for 44 years, but in the end, it's forgive and forget. Wouldn't it be the mark of a more humane society to execute him? And if that means dealing through the state in a final way with someone who has committed the most grave crime, then I don't see that that's a problem. Well, I counter that by simply pointing out that as a matter of logic, uh, it's much worse for an individual to spend the rest of their life on a prison than to be executed immediately. Uh, I don't take the view that there is somewhere down there a hell that all bad people are going to be tortured by. I think, you know, if they're turned off, they're, that's an end on it. And uh, why give them the benefit of being turned off like that uh, when they could be made uh, punished for the rest of their lives? I think it's a far worse punishment, life in prison, because they suffer. They suffer. In 1969, Parliament voted overwhelmingly in favour of permanently abolishing the death penalty for murder. Two years later, capital punishment was also removed for arson in a Royal Naval Dockyard. Now, hanging only remained for treason and piracy. Britain's new position was soon followed by other Western countries, like France and Spain, which through the 1970s would also stop using the death penalty. Even the USA, which hadn't executed anyone since 1967, suspended capital punishment in 1972. In America, the instrument for the temporary abolition of the death penalty was not Congress, it was the Supreme Court. The one part of the uh, government of America which is not susceptible to re-election. It was that body that actually declared that, that at least the process of, of executions in America was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court's decision infuriated the majority of Americans. Private papers of the Chief Justice, who was in the dissent, indicate that he thought that was the end of the death penalty in America, as did most of the abolitionists. They thought they had won their permanent victory. They couldn't have been more wrong and the states immediately responding to overwhelming public support for the death penalty and outrage at the United States Supreme Court decision, 
reenacted death penalty statutes. In 1976, the Supreme Court was forced to review its decision in response to widespread public pressure. Less than two years ago, death cells in prisons throughout America were emptied when the Supreme Court ruled against capital punishment. The court decided that it was unconstitutional because it was a cruel and unusual form of punishment in the sense that it was so arbitrary. Some people would be sentenced to death and others merely to a term of imprisonment for the same offence. Now, though, the court is having to think again. And while it's doing so, death rows throughout the country are filling up again. The Supreme Court voted to reinstate capital punishment. And in 1977, Gary Gilmore became the first person to be executed in the US for 10 years. Gilmore eventually insisted that the state of Utah put him to death. So he was the first of many volunteers from death row, basically people who uh, could save their own lives by continuing to appeal and to have their cases reviewed and have their cases delayed. He took the opposite path. He volunteered. The state of Utah put him to death. And from that day onwards, the execution pattern began once again in the USA, very slowly at first. In 1977, there was only two. And then in the early 1980s, there were a handful each year. But by the end of the 1990s, um, there was almost 100 people being put to death each year. Gilmore was executed by a firing squad in Utah. Since then, other US states have chosen to use the gas chamber or lethal injection to carry out death sentences. Gilmore's execution hit the headlines in the British press and inspired some British lawyers to offer to cross the Atlantic and help defend those facing the death penalty. And the effectiveness claim through the 1980s, British lawyers like Clive Stafford Smith took up cases that challenged America's right to execute. In a fair world, you're going to win, but the world isn't always unfair, so we'll just have But I'd become obsessed with, with the death penalty, and this was from quite a young age. You know, I was very young when I was writing something about it. I was like 16 in school. And I thought it was a history paper. I thought the death penalty was history. and. When I discovered that the Americans were still killing each other, I was really shocked. A death row inmate at Parchment is scheduled to die in the gas chamber in two weeks. Edward... In 1987, a BBC documentary followed Clive Stafford Smith, who had volunteered to act as the lawyer for a man on death row in Mississippi. Fourteen days in May captured his attempts to stop Edward Earl Johnson being executed. The funny thing is, I think about a future. Now that might seem kind of crazy. Now what future could I possibly have in knowing that I might supposedly be executed in the next two weeks? Despite evidence suggesting Johnson was innocent, he was executed in a gas chamber on the 20th of May, 1987. Ladies and gentlemen, at 12.06 a.m. Wednesday, May 20th, Edward Earl Johnson was executed in the lethal gas chamber here at the Mississippi State Penitentiary in conformance with the sentence of the Circuit Court of Lee County. Sitting there watching him be gassed to death in the gas chamber was just horrific. In a way, um, the fact that there were cameras there made it slightly easier because you, you thought this was all a movie or something and someone was going to call cut and it would all be over. But uh, I think that's what Edward thought and that made it a little easier for him, perhaps. When the family asked me why, all I could say was, it's a sick world. It's a sick world. Thank you. 14 days in May, was one of a number of British documentaries which attacked capital punishment in America. These films helped shape the ongoing debate in the UK. When you see documentaries of people on death row in America, which are fantastically common, you get the feeling that this is contributing to the debate here, reflecting liberal opinion here, but probably not 
actually reflecting what the majority of the population believe. I don't think it's changed their minds in any way. In many ways, it's the, as so often these things, it's the liberal elite speaking to the liberal elite. While British programme makers used the American experience to highlight the flaws in capital punishment, in the UK itself, there was rising public demand that Britain too should begin executing again. For the first time since abolition, Britain had a Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, who supported the death penalty. And MPs were given a free vote on the subject throughout the 1980s. When I first came into Parliament, there was still, certainly in the public domain, uh, quite an active debate going on about the death penalty because it was the height of the IRA outrages. Um, innocent people were dying in random terror acts. Uh, and people were saying, well, at least bring it back for terrorism. You know, even if you don't bring it back for anything else, at least bring it back for terrorism. So there was, a, there was still quite a lively debate about whether it should be brought back. Uh, when there was a free vote on the death penalty, I always voted for restoration because I do believe there's a very strong moral case for saying that such a deterrent should be available. This government will never surrender to the IRA, never. Really, all of that was really smashed at the end of the 80s and 90s when, of course, the government had to confront the, the fact that in the cases of Irish terrorists, particularly the Birmingham Six and the Gulf of Four, that all of these people had been exonerated on the basis that uh, they had not had a fair trial uh, and that uh, the, the, the evidence was not sufficient to convict. In 1991, the Birmingham Six and Guildford Four were declared innocent and released after spending almost two decades in prison. I've been in prison 15 years for something I didn't do, for something I didn't know anything about. Had Britain retained the death penalty then, they would have almost certainly faced execution. Whether it's Guildford 4, Birmingham 6, Judith Ward, Tottenham 3, and so on, in many of these cases, what transpired was that there was a, a flawed system. Now, you can't have a final verdict like an execution where you haven't got an infallible system, which means that there's a serious risk you're going to, as it were, kill innocent people. It was cases of miscarriages of justice like these that persuaded many in government that Britain could never reinstate capital punishment. In 1994, the last free vote took place in Parliament on reintroducing the death penalty. It was heavily defeated, with Home Secretary Michael Howard now voting in favour of retaining abolition. For a long time, I supported capital punishment because I thought it was a deterrent. And actually, I still think it is a deterrent. But I changed my mind because of the risk of a mistake. It was the cases of the Birmingham Six and the Guildford Four that changed my mind on that. I accepted that you could never completely eliminate the risk of mistake. And since then, I've become averse as well to the whole idea of the state deliberately taking someone's life. But it wasn't until 1998, when the Labour government passed the Crime and Disorder Act, that the death penalty was completely removed from British law. Up until then, executions could still be carried out for treason and piracy. Later that year, the Court of Appeal quashed the 1953 conviction of Derek Bentley, and he was posthumously pardoned. By 2010, 139 countries had abolished the death penalty. We are seeing a greater polarization in the world. 
We are seeing a wide gap between the my mental makeup of those people in the countries that oppose the death penalty uh, and the people in the country who, in the countries that see no problem with it. Surprisingly, the country that has the highest cases of capital punishment per capita is Singapore. But it is believed the country that executes the most people per year is China. The trouble with China is that it's still a state secret and the party will not reveal the number of people sentenced to death and executed. So you have no idea really how many people are put to death there. But at the UN Human Rights Council, at the end of 2007, the Chinese delegate, I think he's called Mr. La Yifan, made a statement that China was reducing its use of the, of the death penalty and was setting in in uh, plans to do so with the ultimate aim of abolishing it. Now, this is a statement really from the state and state authority that abolition is a goal. We haven't heard that from the United States, I'm sorry to say, from the State Department. But even in America today, the use of capital punishment is a lot less widespread. It's also true that amongst the 35 states that have the death penalty, about a third of them never use it another third impose death sentences but rarely carry them out and the death sentences that are carried out are typically in one region of the nation that's to say the south these days nearly all the, more than half of the death sentences that are executed occur in texas so uh, is america a death penalty nation well in parts in 2010 those american states which continue to use the death penalty have been challenged over whether executing an individual in a painful manner infringes their human rights. This debate could see the end of the death penalty in America. But its supporters have gone back to 18th century ideas of punishment to defend the right to execute. To say that it has to be painless is to lose sight of what it is, which is punishment. In its etymology, in its very meaning, the word punishment comes from the same root as pain. It is in its essential conception, painful. If it is not painful, it is not punishment. When killers intentionally, or with a depraved indifference, inflict intense pain and suffering on their victims, in my view, they should die a quick but painful death. Not torture, not drawn out, but quick and painful. The debate about capital punishment has raged for over 200 years. Both sides believe they are in the right. And if the history of capital punishment has taught us one thing, it's that both sides will continue to fight their corner passionately. To challenge your views and learn more about the justice system, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash justice and follow the links to the Open University.